the last question provides a beautiful transition into our next talk. Um, Trish Holden, who is a professor at UC uh, Santa Barbara. Um, so I know you want to move around, but we're actually asking the speakers to stay here and use this microphone so we can see you on the on the camera. Okay. Um, so Trish Holden, who is a professor at UC Santa Barbara in the Brent School of the Environment, is going to talk about two different things. One is actually looking at what we currently know about ecotoxicology of nanoparticles, what happens to them when they get into the environment, and telling you about some of the current research that's going on in that area. And then also uh, just spending a fair amount of time talking about um, an industry survey that was conducted um, both by Professor, Professor Holden's group in collaboration with uh, Barbara Hare Hartharn's group, who's also in the audience uh, today. So thank you, Trish. Thank you, Hillary. As uh, Hillary mentioned, I was asked to talk about um, primarily the industry survey that's just recently completed, and we're in the process of synthesizing the acquired data into a set of, 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 of um, facts, a, a, a knowledge uh, basis for understanding what industry is, is reporting in terms of their environmental health and safety practices. But I'll also start with talking a little bit about ecotoxicological impacts and some of the research that's being performed in the UC CEIN, which Andre introduced to us earlier, the University of California Center for Environmental Implications of Nanotechnology. So as we well know, nanomaterials, engineered nanomaterials, are increasingly incorporated into consumer goods of many different types, from recreational products to textiles, um, Many of these products have short lifetimes, um, and so there's the possibility of exposure uh, to uh, humans during the use of these materials, but also to the environment. As we've heard uh, several times this morning so far, there's so many different types of nanomaterials, and I only have depicted here electron micrographs of one common type, titanium dioxide. And you know, with these nanomaterials, um, they look very simple, and we can capture the range of morphologies and sizes with this type of technology. But what we don't see are the numerous uh, complexities that start to arise when these types of particles, and of course the many different uh, versions on this theme of TiO2 and other types of core chemistries with different functionalities, come into contact with the most fundamental scale of organization in living systems, the cell. In contact with cells, nanomaterials take on uh, new characteristics, acquired characteristics, including acquisition of proteins, other membrane components, and form what's called a nanobiointerface. This in and of itself is a new entity, something that wasn't discussed in the last uh, Q&A session, but was alluded to when we start to concern ourselves with environmental fate and transport, we also must concern ourselves with modifications in the biological uh, system. Modifications can include, in this case, the green particle is a conceptual representation of a nanomaterial of one type that's used to try and interrogate cells, so for beneficial purposes in clinical settings, for example, and in research. But the nanomaterial is a function of being exposed to that fundamental biological scale of organization. The cell can decompose. Those products of decomposition can enter cells where they can accumulate, potentially reform into new nanomaterials. The nanomaterial in its native form can adhere to cells, which may be desirable from the standpoint of a bioimaging standpoint. The particle itself may enter cells we heard about um, a, a lot of primary research uh, uh, earlier this morning that has to do with mammalian systems, whole organisms, where nanomaterials are entering cells and interfering with biological function. This depicts sort of the fate and consequences in the cell. Not shown here are the responses of cells uh, to the particles, which can also be numerous depending upon the fate and transport processes at this scale. What we observe at uh, the whole organism or population scale 
with environmental organisms. And what I'm showing here are two representative examples from the UC Center for Environmental Implications of Nanotechnology, the two different investigator groups. And this is representative of a lot of different research that's going on within the center, but also nationally and internationally. We're environmentally representative organisms, in this case, marine phytoplankton, and in another case, uh, soybeans grown hydroponically in this case, are exposed to nanomaterials of one type or another. Those nanomaterials acquire characteristics uh, that are um, part and parcel with uh, the conditions of exposure, the media in which they're exposed to the organism. And what we see with marine phytoplankton of different types, um, that there's a growth reduction that can occur in this case with a native nanoscale zinc oxide. In this case, it was determined that zinc oxide was reducing the growth rate by virtue of dissolution, and it was actually the zinc ions that were causing a growth inhibitory effect. These are just exemplary two studies. We could have an entire discussion on the plethora of uh, primary research that's being generated about different effects, different types of effects, and different mechanisms of effects of engineered nanomaterials on environmental receptors. Another example is work performed by Jorge Gardea Torres' group, also within the CEIN, where uh, exposure of soybeans hydroponically to cerium oxide causes genotoxicity, so genetic change in the plant. These are examples, again, a very small subset of the many types of examples that are out there. Of course, there needs to be much more research in this area looking at environmental receptors. But there are examples of what can happen to specific uh, environmental receptors under conditions of, of exposure, under laboratory uh, conditions. But what actually happens in the field, as was discussed in the last Q&A session, is uh, highly dependent upon the complex set of state and transport processes that ultimately result in the delivery of nanomaterials in one form or another to a receptor, whether it's individual cells or uh, whether it's whole organisms, populations, or communities. So those state and transport processes, these are also uh, being studied extensively. I'm not going to uh, talk about results from the center today, but they have to do with um, many of the processes that are very well understood for other contaminants in soil, water, including groundwater. These are the processes that link the origins of waste including potentially nanomaterial waste at the point of use, consumer use of, of nano-containing products, but also at the point of manufacturing. So manufacturers generate uh, some level of waste, as do consumers. Uh, we all are trying to control emissions of waste, and the control to the degree that emissions are controlled at manufacturing sites, this is uh, uh, how we are uh, able to describe the environmental performance of uh, manufacturers generally. So interestingly, as it turns out, environmental performance, uh, the c continuum of environmental performance in manufacturing and the continuum of worker safety in manufacturing actually have something to do with each other, such that operational performance can be maximized when both worker safety and environmental performance are maximized. In other words, as goes the inside of a manufacturing setting, so does go the outside. So this trans, uh, transitions into the discussion and obviates the link between environment and eh and S. How then do industries decide what to do on the inside now, there are many guidance documents as of 2009, and we've heard about elements of these guidance, doc guidance documents, uh, most completely the NIOSH guidance documents this morning. But there are many agencies internationally that have developed guidance documents, including uh, NIOSH in the US. And in general, these provide uh, sets of recommendations that are mostly not nanospecific that they do provide, as we heard about earlier, a tiered approach, a recommendation for uh, exposure control that is uh, orchestrated around uh, a tiered mentality. 
uh, to err on the side of precaution, nanomaterials are advised to be treated as hazardous. And there's always an acknowledgement in these documents that risks are uncertain. We've continued to hear about that this morning, and that toxicological information is lacking. The rest of my talk, I want to focus on a survey that was recently completed, an international survey of industry on reported practices and perceived risks related to health, safety, and environmental stewardship. The list of co-authors uh, of whom I'm representing today are depicted here in this slide. It consists of a group of students at the master's level at the Brin School. The study was overall led by Dr. Barbara Hare Hawthorne, who's the director for the Center of Nanotechnology and Society. The study was performed with the support of, of course, NSF and EPA through the UCCEIN. The doctoral candidate, uh, Cassandra Engelman, is the lead scholar on this. And my role was the advisor, but also I would say the scientific advisor to what really is a social science uh, project and the advisor to the students who were actively involved in gathering the primary data from industry. We were the group with a different set of students that performed the ICON funded survey in 2006, the first international publicly available survey of industry uh, with regards to the reported practices in environmental health and safety. That study was uh, posted on the ICON website in full, but also subsequently published in 2008, Environmental Science and Technology. I mention this because while we would love to be able to say we can do a longitudinal comparison and look at how reported practices and perceptions in industry have changed across time. In fact, there are different populations that were surveyed in 2006 compared to who we surveyed in 2009-2010. We had an Asia oversample uh, in the 2006 survey that was published in 2008. That's to make clear it's a different population than we spoke with uh, this year for the most part. But what we heard at that time was that industry was telling us that they didn't believe that nanotechnology or nanomaterials posed any special risks. Despite that, they were reporting to have nanospecific EHS programs. And this was highly related to them having uh, reported having also general EHS programs. So firms that were reportedly having general EHS programs were more likely to also adopt nanospecific EHS programs. Mostly, the nanospecific EHNS programs were comprised of PP&E and engineering controls. There was little monitoring of the workplace that was reported at that time. And there was also uh, very nonspecific waste management practices that were reported. And overall, the firms were reporting that information was lacking, in part because that was a unified voice that came out of this initial survey. This inspired ICON to develop the Good Nano Guide, which was referred to earlier, which has become a very tremendous web-based resource. In this survey, coming back several years later, three years later, um, knowing that guidance documents had been implemented and had become widely available in the intervening years between 2006 when we first spoke with industry and 2009, now we came back and we asked, what are industries reportedly doing now? What are the relationships to industry characteristics? What does industry reportedly believe? We asked more about industry beliefs this time, particularly about their beliefs regarding risk and regulation. And we also asked uh, uh, ourselves, how do beliefs relate to reported actions? I can't report on everything uh, that we discovered in this survey today, but I'm going to hit the highlights. First, I'd like to tell you what the main sections of this survey instrument were comprised of. We gathered information about firm characteristics, sizes of firms, age, types of nanomaterials handled. We asked about industry practices. We asked about perceived risks of nanomaterials to health and environment. And we asked about access to information cost of uh, environmental health and safety. The research was performed. Again, I showed you who was involved in the research. My role was as an advisor, both scientifically and to the student interviewers. Um, these were structured interviews that were mostly conducted over the phone uh, through a 45-minute process. The, the survey was also available online in several languages. 
And as with all the survey work that we've performed, of course, this was all uh, participation was voluntary completely and uh, confidential. We asked over 300, so we, we tried to identify the universe of industries, uh, and this is not a, a, a simple task to do because it relies on self-identification through various uh, documents and through various organizations who make it their business to identify who's involved in nano worldwide. Um, but out of the universe that we identified of nano uh, manufacturers and nano industries, we invited over 300 participants. Um, we had a response rate of 24%, and this amounted to uh, 78 participants from throughout the world. And as you can see here, there was a, a tremendous oversample as we aspired to achieve this time around in the United States. Who participated? Who was actually on the phone with us? For the most part, it was someone at a high level in the firm, a CEO, president, executive director. There were also chief technical officers, uh, to some degree EH&S officers, scientists, but more often than not, it was the person in charge and sometimes there were multiple people that were conversing with us. The participating company characteristics, they were involved in R&D. I should clarify that we were not talking to universities. We explicitly excluded universities and national labs in this work. Uh, we were trying uh, to as completely and, and uh, succinctly as possible talk only to and speak only with uh, industries involved in manufacturing, selling, buying, using, consulting, but not universities. Um, most of the applications that were reported to us were electronics and IT, energy and coatings, but they spanned a wide spectrum. These were the top three. I'm showing you uh, the data in a more generalized form in the essence of time. Most of the firms were small. There were mid and large size, mid and large size firms, but most were under 20 personnel. Uh, and the nano proportion of the workforce uh, varied um, and it was exceptionally high uh, in small firms because the total number of uh, personnel uh, handling nanomaterials was relatively constant across the various size firms. So it turned out that the proportion was very high in small firms. The materials handled were everything that we hear about um, and variations on those themes. We asked about uh, primary particles, we did not ask uh, companies to disclose anything about coatings that uh, would be uh, uh, revealing uh, or would be of a proprietary nature. The top three materials reportedly handled are uh, silver, titanium, silica, but also zinc, single walled carbon nanotubes, and gold. And many companies were involved in handling more than one type. Uh, by far, they were handling mostly uh, reportedly powder and suspended forms of nanomaterials, occasionally, uh, less frequently, uh, handling embedded forms. I want to highlight some of the survey findings from this point forward about health and safety practices, the relationships between practices and characteristics, and then a little bit of further analysis about uh, reported practices and uh, perception of risk. This is the only slide where I show a comparison between the 2006 study, the ICON-funded study that was subsequently published in 2008. That's the left uh, column of circles, and the right column of circles is from the current study. Here, all we're showing you are the percentages in the top row of participants with the general EHNS program. So you can see in both studies, uh, we had a fairly high percentage of participants that reported having a general environmental health and safety program. The bottom row of pie uh, charts, this is the percent of participants with a nano-specific EHNS program, and the percentages are probably very similar across the two studies. That is, it's a substantially fewer number of firms that report having a nano-specific EHNS program, and it's the same for both the 2006 and the 2009 uh, study. We asked about use of personal protective equipment. In the blocks here, the color coding recommended and required, this doesn't refer to the guidance documents. We asked participants to tell us 
uh, whether these pr personal protective equipment were recommended or required in their manufacturing site, if they were recommending or requiring these personal protective equipment. It varied, uh, of course, but what we know here are that uh, eye protection, lab coats and nitrile gloves, and respiratory protection, um, these were the top PPNE that were either recommended or required and, in fact, uh, frequently required. Um, this is consistent mostly with the guidance documents, uh, that is the 2009 documents that we re reviewed in uh, preparation for this survey, um, suggesting that there is some uh, good level of performance in terms of adopting PPNE. On the other hand, um, the use of latex gloves and the use of dust masks which are also recommended or required at a comparable level are, are not recommended necessarily within guidance documents. In fact, um, uh, they are um, recommended against. We asked what methods are used for cleaning areas in which nanomaterials are handled and by far um, wet wiping, which is um, also consistent with what would be as suggested, recommended in guidance documents, was reported more frequently. But we also uh, saw a significant number of reports of household shop vacuuming, uh, sweeping, and also the use of compressed air. So this would be consistent with some of the observations that were reported in the field uh, earlier today. These would be uh, recommended against, uh, particularly uh, in industries, of course, working with nano powders. We asked about nanomaterials waste management, and this is kind of a tricky thing to ask because there really isn't uh, necessarily a right answer, uh, of course, in the guidance document. Um, we asked companies if they were involved in uh, nanospecific waste management, and mostly they said no, uh, and mostly they dispose of their nano waste as hazardous waste, um, probably because that's the only other uh, option that one would choose acting out of precaution, um, but overwhelmingly they're not segregating, uh, well not overwhelmingly, half and half are segregating those wastes and a few more are uh, not than uh, are segregating wastes uh, disposed of as hazardous or non-hazardous. Looking at the respondents and the characteristics of our respondents, we really had two populations, and this was an overwhelming theme from the survey. There was one population that was a smaller, younger, and less, ex less experienced manufacturing uh, companies. And then there was a population that were larger, older, and more experienced in handling nanomaterials. What we found um, as we, so what we, 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 we um, adopted our own nomenclature the younger, less experienced, we called startup companies, and the older and uh, larger companies with more experience, we called them established. We found some relationships along these lines that we'd like to share. One is that the startup companies, the smaller, younger, and less experienced, were more frequently reporting to have nano-specific VHNS programs. There was a significant difference in this regard. They were also more frequently likely to report advertising that they have nanomaterials in the products that they sell. On the other hand, they were less likely uh, frequently to uh, report monitoring the workplace, whereas established companies were more frequently reporting monitoring the workplace. This may be a result of uh, the cost of monitoring, the cost that would be imposed particularly on small firms um, and I reflect again back on uh, small firms and um, the fact that uh, what they may be doing uh, will be at a greater cost because of their size. Uh, we asked about potential impediments to implementing a nanospecific EHNS program. Again, in 2006, we heard overwhelmingly it was lack of information. We've heard that again. The majority of uh, the impediments reported were uh, just simply insufficient amount of information, but also lack of guidance and regulation, despite the fact that there are many guidance documents nationally and internationally that are available. Budget constraints were not uh, uh, as significantly uh, a factor uh, as reported by either small or, or large firms and there was no significant difference between these startups and established companies in terms of reporting budget constraints as an impediment. 
Larger companies were, in fact, more likely to identify, however, a lack of information as an impediment as it compared to small firms. Reflecting on the, the size of, of, of these startups versus uh, large firms, again, just to reiterate, uh, small firms having a, a sizable proportion of their personnel uh, involved in uh, uh, handling nanomaterials. Um, they are absorbing um, um, a larger, um, probably, investment to uh, perform nano EHNS, nano EHNS, and also monitoring. And so it is important, we feel, to recognize this is a different population, and that came out very clearly in our respondent pool. So then we asked participants, and this was a significant part of the survey, it was about one third of the survey. Uh, to tell us about their views on risk by a type of nanomaterial. Uh, there are many, many other questions besides uh, uh, the ones that I will uh, show you the responses for today, but here we show some very interesting results from their views on, on specifically risk. Um, lumping across the um, moderate and high risk, um, there were not, there were no significant differences across these different nanomaterial types from carbon nanotubes through other carbonaceous quantum dots, heavy metals, et cetera. Uh, that is, there was a significant number of um, respondents that reported that there were moderate, moderate to high risk uh, with these materials. But there was also a significant number of respondents that is the experts in manufacturing that reported not knowing whether there were risks associated with these different types of nanomaterials. We thought that was also a very interesting result. We found that there were some differences in um, beliefs, uh, perceptions by location. We asked this question. In my company, we asked the, the respondents to uh, respond to this question. In my company, we worry that nanotechnologies may encounter unwarranted public backlash, such as that which accompany genetically modified foods in Europe. Do they agree or do they not agree? Um, by far, overwhelmingly, uh, companies that were headquartered in the U.S. disagreed with this, uh, whereas outside of the U.S., uh, significantly fewer companies um, uh, disagreed. We asked them to respond to this statement. Industries working with nanomaterials can be trusted to regulate the safe handling of these materials. Uh, overwhelmingly, the majority of respondents agreed with this statement. They also overwhelmingly agreed with the following statement. Businesses are better informed about their own workplace safety needs than our government agencies. And they also overwhelmingly agreed with voluntary reporting approaches for risk management are effective for protecting human health and the environment. But there was also a substantial fraction that disagreed uh, with this statement. There was a distribution, but again, a preponderance of agreement with this statement. Employees are ultimately responsible for their own safety at work. And that's the primary data that I wanted to share with you from uh, this survey. It's a much more extensive set of questions, but these are the highlights that I wanted to share with you today. The conclusions from this presentation, uh, mainly uh, from the survey, are that smaller and younger companies um, are more likely to incorporate safe handling practices. This is the sum total of our observation of the data, the entire data set that we uh, gathered. But larger firms are more likely to report a lack of information as an impediment in nano EHNS. Uh, small firms do have this higher proportion of workforce handling uh, nanomaterials. Perhaps that motivates them in developing safer practices. This is only something that we can um, assume from the results of a study as such. And then there are these sort of contradictions and certainties and uncertainties. And we think that the perceptions and belief uh, uh, data set that we have from this study should be uh, extremely interesting to regulators as they think about uh, the regulatory future in this arena that is taking into account uh, what businesses think um, about what government, uh, how government should be involved, what they do and what they don't know. And, um, you know, looking overall at the contradictions that is regarding that there are risks, but some contraindicated practices by um, uh, 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 the reported HNS practices in these firms. So, 
I want to acknowledge um, there we had support from many colleagues, but first and foremost, we had uh, the respondents that worked with us uh, to be interviewed, and it took a considerable amount of time on their part, and we thank them, um, uh, uh, first of all, for their participation. We had a number of different colleagues from other institutions that are listed here. We had advice uh, from governments and industry, including um, working with ICON again to initiate this. We had substantial um, support from NIOSH uh, from an expert uh, level and also from, from industry. And these are uh, industry participants or industry um, experts who were, who were willing to be acknowledged here. And of course, the financial support for the study came substantially from the National Science Foundation uh, and the Environmental Protection Agency, both to the UCCEIN, but also to the CNS at UCSB. Thank you. Tricia, if I might make a, uh, just a, a comment. So from having just been with this um, uh, national effort through the world to you know, talk to different stakeholders, including industry, <clears throat> in addition to the uh, important points that you've made, I think there, there are two areas <clears throat> where I think um, industry um, still have to be responsive and, 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 and that is number one at the level of implementation of the knowledge of safety assessment uh, into products because at the moment it is seen as largely an exercise that is carried out by academia and the so the important response that you see there is you know lack of knowledge is there is actually a lot of knowledge that have been generated but still a paucity of implementation in industry and as a result regulation is moving ahead in order to fill those gaps and that I think may have some unintended consequences and there'll be a longer that there'll be a longer pathway to the marketplace the second area that closely tied to the comment that I just made is the uh, understanding that the knowledge that is being generated actually could be used as an integral exercise of developing new products and not an after the fact cleanup, i.e. the ability to safely design materials and make better materials which will have intellectual property and in the end uh, in my opinion, return the investment in many different cases because you'll put better products out there. Thank you. Agreed. Um, let me comment on the first comment that you made. Uh, we did ask in this survey if industries were involved in conducting primary research in toxicology. And just as within in 2006, they're not reporting to be involved in doing much primary research. So I would echo your comment that it would be important for them to make uh, contributions that are substantial in this uh, area. Yeah, I have two questions from the web. Uh, do you have a breakdown by numbers and states of the U.S.-based companies that participated in this survey? Uh, we are not providing that and we probably won't provide that because um, the demographics may be quite skewed and we first and foremost need to protect the confidentiality of the participants in those surveys. Um, and in some cases there may have been only one or two companies from the state that participated and it could uh, border on being very, be, be very revealing of the identity of the participants so we would be very cautious about doing that. And then next question, has there been any research into wastewater discharge or pretreatment practices? There is literature, scientific literature, that is quite informative and growing in this area. Um, everything from looking at how much nanosilver is being um, removed from uh, textiles during the course of washing, what happens to nanosilver when it enters wastewater treatment plant. These are really important areas of research to nanomaterials that um, become part of the final residual in wastewater treatment plants and affect 
uh, through their uh, accumulation in biosolids, crops that are grown in soils that are amended with biosolids. So these are areas of research that um, were not within the scope of the survey that I presented today, but it's certainly within the scope of research in the CEIN by others and uh, um, have been reported on in literature, but there's a need for more information. A uh, question and a comment. Uh, with regard to the question about the lack of information, is there any further breakdown of whether that pertained to toxicity or to control guidance? The question was um, asked in terms of um, is this an impediment to implementing uh, nanospecific health and safety and product stewardship practices? And uh, beyond that, we have um, individual comments, but I don't have that information with me today to, to share. We will make that information available in our final report. And the comment is that it was disconcerting to uh, learn that the respondents thought that the responsibility for safety and health in the workplace devolved to the workers as opposed to the employers. And it'd be interesting to see how that broke down according to uh, U.S. and other countries. My question is when you are comparing the companies that are less than 10 years old versus long-term employers, uh, wouldn't you say that there would be a higher likelihood of a startup company to look at the safety and health regulations or look at potential health-related issues, they're more likely to ask versus a company who's been around for a long time might be more complacent, say, we already have a safety and health and just do what they're doing and treat everything business as usual in terms of safety and health. That's one interesting interpretation and it very well could be knowing why. And so first of all, um, it's important to recognize that unlike what we heard about earlier from NIOSH, these, there, there was no site investigation the responses uh, that we acquired were reports from industry. There was no uh, in-person follow-up or site investigation or verification or these types of verification. But still, if we take the reports at face value, then we ask, why are they reporting what they're reporting? And I think that could be a, a viable interpretation of that set of findings from the study. Thank you. 